go. Um, I will email the link to the recording to all registered participants by the end of the week. And then the recording will also be available on our um, Center for Reading Science YouTube channel. Also, if anyone is interested or you know anyone that may be interested, we do have an information session for our doctoral program on Wednesday. Um, so this session will outline uh, Mount St. Joseph's Reading Science Doctoral Program. Dr. Amy Murdoch will lead the session and cover admission requirements, any prerequisites, uh, courses in the program, um, faculty, the dissertation process, and there'll also be current students there um, to give them a perspective of, of um, the experience. We also have uh, memberships to our Center for Reading Science. If you or anyone you know may be interested, uh, membership benefits include a members only webinar, book studies, there's a quarterly newsletter, access to the Center Resource Library, and then um, access to the Mount St. Joseph um, Library Network, as well as research support. So if you know anyone that may need that, um, so without further ado, I would like to welcome Hannah Putman and Christy Ellis from the National Council on Teacher Quality. Hannah is the National Council, Council on Teachers Quality Managing Director of Research. She ins ensures that NCTQ's analysis is grounded in strong research and methodology. And her work includes highlighting state and district policies on topics such as clinical practice and reading and evaluating teacher preparation in areas including content knowledge and classroom management. Hannah comes to NCTQ after conducting research with Weststat, a social science research company. Previously, Hannah taught seventh and ninth grade in English in New York as a Teacher for America Corps member. Christy Ellis serves as a director of teacher prep with NCTQ, and her work includes the Teacher Prep Reviews Reading Foundation Standard and Classroom Management Standard. Christy came to NCTQ after teaching third grade in Cle Cleveland, Ohio. Um, so for the duration of our talk, before I turn it over, if you want to keep your cameras on or off, it's up to you for personal preference. And then if you have any questions or comments, feel free just to unmute. Uh, we're a small enough group where we can have a nice conversation, or you can also drop it in the chat and I'll help monitor the chat for Christy and Hannah. All right, so now I will turn things over to them. Thanks so much, Megan, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It's wonderful to be here. Um, my colleague Christy is getting the slide set up. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the National Council on Teacher Quality, we are a research and policy nonprofit driven by the mission that every child deserves effective teachers and every teacher deserves the opportunity to become effective. And we're so excited to be with, with you all, all of you here today to share some spotlights from our recent release, the Clinical Practice Action Guide, which just came out about a month ago. It tells the story of how stories of how many states, districts, and prep programs have built strong research-aligned approaches to clinical practice and student teaching. Um, and you can see the link uh, Christy just put in the chat to that clinical practice action guide. So again, my name is Hannah Putman, and I'm joined tonight by my colleague Christy Ellis, our Director of Teacher Prep. So in the next hour, we will discuss why clinical practice matters, what the key areas of clinical practice are, what different prep programs have accomplished in this area, and what types of practice we typically see in the field. We also have time at the end for Q&A, but please feel free to jump in, as Megan said, at any point with questions. I think that leads to a richer conversation. So let's talk about why, why focus on clinical practice. Over the last few years, more and more research has come out demonstrating the importance of having a high quality clinical practice experience. So research has found that student teaching with an effective cooperating teacher can give a first year teacher the boost they need to be as effective as one in their second or even their third year. Second, student teaching in a classroom with similar demographics to a, to a teacher's first job is associated with both higher teacher effectiveness and better teacher retention. Third, when districts host student teachers, those teachers are more likely to get jobs in the district. 
And fourth, districts in general that host student teachers are less likely, that host student teachers are less likely to have teacher vacancies. So clinical practice matters for, for helping teachers improve, for keeping them in the classroom, and for addressing staffing shortages. But we've been tracking how teacher prep programs approach clinical practice in the field for a decade now. And despite this growing body of research, we haven't seen a lot of movement. In our teacher prep review clinical practice standard, we score programs based on the length of clinical practice, whether it's at least 10 weeks, whether programs expect cooperating teachers to be instructionally effective or have experience mentoring adults, and how often the program supervisor observes student teachers. While our scoring algorithm has been largely unchanged, we still see less than 5% of programs meeting those expectations and earning an A every time we've rated them from 2013 to 2020. In fact, the area where they tend to fall short is the one that matters most, ensuring that every student teacher is paired with an effective cooperating teacher based on either their track record of academic of raising student achievement or their experience mentoring adults. But rather than rate programs again, possibly seeing little change, we've used this past year to take a step back and look at clinical practice from a more systems level approach. While teacher prep programs play a pivotal role in building these experiences, they can't do this work alone. They need to partner with school districts and ideally receive support and guidance from their state. So this past March, we released a clinical practice framework detailing what high quality clinical practice looks like and what actions each of these key actors, prep programs, districts, and states should take. And Christy's uh, going to put the link to that in the chat as well. So to develop this framework, we did a deep dive into the research and also pulled together an advisory panel of experts in the field. So we have put together a robust advisory panel, as you can see, with experts and leaders from teacher prep programs, from school districts, from state education agencies, as well as research and advocacy organizations. They've been engaged throughout this process, and we deeply appreciate their advice and feedback. We also surveyed teacher prep programs and districts to get their input on what matters most. And you can read more about their feedback in a recent district trendline newsletter. So based on, their, on this engagement with the field and research, we've identified six focus areas. And I'll briefly explain the components of each focus area. And for each one, our clinical practice framework details specific actions that prep programs, districts, and states can undertake to strengthen clinical practice. Keep in mind, this framework establishes the hallmarks of strong clinical experiences, but we are not at this point rating programs on this framework. So don't, don't get nervous that you're gonna see grades based on this anytime soon. So I'll walk through each of the, those six areas as well as the key components. Um, and for each of these key components, again, there's actions that are laid out for, for prep programs, for districts and for states to take. So let's first talk about the importance of strong district prep program partnerships. These partnerships serve as the backbone of a successful clinical practice experience. When districts and prep programs come together with clear shared goals, it creates a strong foundation for preparing student uh, future teachers. And these partnerships work best when the roles and responsibilities are clearly defined through a governance structure that lays out who's responsible for what, from identifying cooperating teachers to setting expectations for their candidates. We've also heard that things like setting timelines and, and um, consequences for not meeting them it can also be helpful. Frequent check-ins between prep programs and districts assure that everybody's aligned on those goals, whether it's addressing upcoming hiring needs or making sure that student teachers are ready for the classroom on day one. And the collaborative nature of these real relationships really elevates the quality of the teacher preparation experience. We next look at the match between student teachers and their cooperating teachers or mentor teachers. Learning from a strong mentor teacher matters much more than any other aspect of a new teacher student teaching experience. And it can help new teachers be as effective as second or even third year teachers. So prep programs and districts need to use data-driven approaches to identify cooperating teachers who are not only strong instructors, but also effective mentors. It's important to consider student outcomes and teachers' abilities to guide adults. Programs should also consider offering stipends to cooperating teachers to attract highly qualified mentors, as well as providing financial support to student teachers to make this experience more viable. This kind of intentional pairing can have a lasting effect on student teachers, helping them feel and be more prepared and confident when they have classrooms of their own. We also look at the training that cooperating teachers and program supervisors should receive. 
Being a great teacher doesn't necessarily mean that somebody is going to be a great mentor, which is why training for cooperating teachers and program supervisors is critical. Mentoring adults requires a different set of skills, particularly when it comes to providing meaningful and specific feedback. We know from research that student teachers benefit most from a combination of feedback, detailed situation-specific insights from their cooperating teachers and broader guidance from their program supervisors. To make sure feedback is helpful and consistent, both cooperating teachers and supervisors need training, particularly on observation instruments and on adult mentoring strategies. So we've heard, for example, from programs about how they practice having difficult conversations with their cooperating teachers. This allows them to provide the kind of feedback that student teachers can immediately use to, to improve and to prepare for the challenges of the classroom. We also consider where student teachers are, are at place for their clinical experience, since this can also be very significant. It's not just about having a good mentor. The placement site itself plays a major role in a teacher's development. Ideally, student teachers should be placed in schools that reflect the kind of environments where they are likely to be hired after graduation. For example, if a candidate is likely to work in a low-income school, their clinical experience should mirror that setting as much as possible, since it leads to them being more effective when they go on to be, become teachers. Collaboration between districts and prep programs is essential to ensure that these placements are aligned with their future hiring needs. Prep programs should seek out schools with strong climates, uh, low teacher turnover, and high student, student learning gains, as well as schools that match the demographics of their future teaching positions. These qualities increase the likelihood that student teachers will thrive once they're in charge of their own classroom. So we next looked at the, the prog progression of development for student teacher skills. We know that effective teacher preparation is all about building gradual skill development. Aspiring teachers need to often start small, observing a classroom or assisting with tutoring, and then work their way up to full-time student teaching. So field experiences should align with high quality curricula and give candidates opportunities to apply what they're learning in real world settings. So frequent observations coupled with detailed feedback can help student teachers refine their skills. Over time, these experiences should increase in difficulty preparing candidates uh, to, to take on full-time teaching responsibilities. By the time they complete their clinical practice, candidates should have a clear understanding of grade level standards, classroom management, and how to use data to inform their teaching. Finally, data and outcomes are really essential to continuously improving teacher preparation. It's not enough to simply track student teachers during their clinical practice. We need to gather data on their long-term outcomes, whether they're hired into teaching positions, how they perform in the classroom, whether they stay in the profession, and in which schools and districts they stay in. Programs should gather feedback from student teachers, from cooperating teachers, and from placement schools to get a full picture of what's working and what isn't. And this information can inform improvements to coursework, field experiences, and mentor support. Tracking hiring metrics and performance data can also help ensure that the clinical experience is setting teachers up for success from day one. So it's about using data to refine and strengthen the entire teacher pipeline, ensuring that future teachers are better prepared for the realities of the classroom. If you'd like to dig into any of these specific focus areas further and see what the specific actions are within each component, you can take a look at our framework up on our website. So while this framework was developed based on research and expert input, we were worried that it was a little aspirational. Um, but we know that this work is actually possible. It's, it's not just pie in the sky. So to learn more about the many places getting clinical practice right, we interviewed states, districts, and prep programs that are already doing amazing work. And we feature these stories as well as tools and resources in our action guide. We're gonna go over some of the prep program actions that are highlighted in our, in our action guide tonight. And we encourage you to check out the website for more information and for links to resources that were shared by each case study. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Christy Ellis who will share some of the specific examples that we saw. And again, you can read much more about these stories in the action guide. Thank you, Hannah. So we're gonna start with uh, a school that you guys are very familiar with. <laughs> uh, Mount St. Joseph University faced two key challenges when developing their clinical practice program, navigating initial reluctance to partner with local districts and ensuring research-based methods aligned with district practices. Dean Laura Saylor worked to establish strong, lasting partnerships with local schools, creating a clinical program embedded directly into the classroom. Their teacher candidates now engage with real students from the start, blending coursework with hands-on experience. 
This partnership not only benefits the university, but also the district, as Mount St. Joseph's evidence-based methods have led to improved student reading outcomes. By embedding field experiences early and maintaining a focus on research-driven practices, MSJ's program is ensuring that their graduates are ready to tackle the challenges of today's classroom. Uh, and if you do check out our action guide, you'll not only see more information on the different case studies I'm going to go over today, but they've also provided some helpful resources that you can you know, download and see if they're useful for you within your own work. We also looked at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, they face a critical teacher shortage with an average of nearly 3,000 vacancies annually, while prep programs are only producing around 1,000 teachers a year. UNLV tackled this issue by developing one of the largest teacher apprenticeship programs in the country, partnering with eight of the state's 17 counties, including both urban and rural areas. The program addresses key barriers, including financial constraints, by offering apprentices free tuition and stipends while they complete a two-year program. Notably, it's also providing three mentors per apprentice and over 2,500 hours of on-the-job learning, making a robust solution to the teacher shortage. Early outcomes are promising with a 94% graduation rate and 90% retention of graduates in the classroom three years later. This innovative approach has shown significant promise in addressing the state's staffing needs, particularly in high needs schools. Western Governor University, WGU, faces a unique challenge with its national online teacher preparation program, serving around 5,000 candidates in 50 states and around 5,000 school districts. To address the challenge of providing high quality clinical opportunities at this scale, WGU combines real classroom experience with innovative online simulations like Mersion, which allow candidates to practice skills in a low risk environment. They've also implemented a robust observation system using Go React, which enables remote feedback and six observations per candidate. This approach ensures candidates who need more support receive it, and data shows that 86% of school principals rate WGU graduates highly, demonstrating that the program's success uh, in preparing teachers across diverse regions. U.S. PrEP faces the challenge of helping residency programs scale while maintaining quality. While it's relatively easy to manage small boutique programs, growing them to serve hundreds of candidates is much more complex. To address this, U.S. PrEP redefined roles such as transforming the traditional supervisor into a site coordinator who collaborates with faculty and districts, ensuring a clear feedback loop and stronger partnerships. They also work with districts to secure stipends for residents, often by allocating budgets that allow student teachers to serve as paraprofessionals or substitutes. This leads to a significant success, including one district in Texas paying residents around $18,000 per year. The results are promising, with U.S. PrEP seeing positive impacts on teacher retention and student achievement. And lastly, we also looked at Southeastern Louisiana University, a rural PrEP program which recognized the need for deeper collaboration with district partners to improve teacher preparation. One aspect of improving this partnership was by co-constructing their collaborations, including holding regular governance meetings with districts and ensuring ongoing feedback and data sharing to strengthen these partnerships. They also shifted to a year-long residency program, expanding from six to 10 district partners since the pandemic. Additionally, feedback revealed that the program was too focused on having candidates create lessons from scratch, rather than teaching them how to implement existing high-quality instructional materials that are already used in schools. In response, Southeastern adjusted its approach to integrating high quality instructional materials into their curriculum. This transition is still in its early stages, but the PrEP program remains committed to continuous improvement, emphasizing transparency and quality over quantity in their evolution. And I'm gonna hand it back to Hannah. Thanks, Christy. So one of my favorite parts of working this action guide as I had all of these conversations is hearing some of the common challenges and common themes that emerged. So in addition to the case studies and resources, we developed what we call but what about uh, sections within each uh, each focus area where we dig into a few key challenges or common themes that we heard and pulled together examples from across a lot of different uh, case studies and and other entities that weren't featured in case studies. So I'm going to share just a few of these. 
Um, so, for example, making clinical practice more financially viable was a top concern for many PrEP programs. Um, one state, which unfortunately we couldn't include in the action guide, um, mentioned that when they were tr trying to figure out why they were having so many people enter teacher PrEP and then not complete the program, uh, financial constraints were actually one of the biggest barriers that their candidates faced. And this is a, a theme that we were hearing again and again. So in this section, we look at uh, different policies and practices that have put in, been put into place to make sure that student teachers can afford to student teach. So in addition to reading about state policies in this section, you can also learn more about a program in Colorado, PEBC, which offers substantial stipends for residents. And they actually offer the greatest amount on the high end of that 42K for people of color and those working in hard to fill content areas. As a result of the residency program coupled with these stipends, they now see 93% of their teachers hired after the first year of clinical practice. So almost everybody going through the program is getting jobs in the classroom. And four and five teachers who go through their program are still in the classroom five years later. And their cohort is also much more diverse than the Colorado workforce as a whole. Um, Similarly, Beaumont ISD in Texas has worked with their local PrEP program and actually supported by U.S. PrEP to establish a residency program. And they found funds to pay their residents a pretty sizable stipend by having those residents also spend just a couple of days a week offering release time to their cooperating teachers and eventually to other teachers in their school so that they can serve as substitute teachers while their cooperating teachers go on to mentor other new teachers or while other teachers go to PD, professional development opportunities. Um, uh, Christy mentioned some of the work around <laughs> high quality instructional materials. And this again was a theme that we heard from several places, um, especially given the movement uh, around literacy and making sure that all schools are using high quality instructional materials. There's now a push to make sure that candidates are prepared to use those materials. So um, as, as Christy mentioned, um, because of a state requirement, Southeastern Louisiana now embeds assignments that integrate high quality instructional materials from freshman year with assignments like comparing two lessons on the same topic from different criteria uh, curricula. They also require that districts, the state also requires that districts publish which curricula they're using, which helps the prep program really focus in on which curricula are going to be most relevant for their candidates to learn. Um, we also see other examples like Tennessee setting state policies, which can support prep programs and better meeting the needs of their districts. Um, we also take a look at observation instruments that are used. So as a few examples, um, we heard from researchers at University of North Carolina, Charlotte, that they were troubled that there was no observation instrument that was really focused specifically on literacy instruction and reading, despite the importance of this area. So they have set about developing one, and they're currently piloting it and working on publishing their results. So hopefully that will be publicly available with some validity studies in the near future. Um, and again, we're excited to feature Mount St. Joseph University. Um, they have done a lot of work to refine the observation instrument to meet their own needs. So they've created the dispositional instructional content specific constant content specific evaluation or DICE, which modifies the state's expectation for in-service teachers so that it's more achievable for, for student teachers. So for example, someone earning a high score on the DICE would be considered as a top student teacher, equivalent to a good novice teacher rather than expecting them to re reach the level of a highly effective veteran teacher. And the program has really worked to ensure the validity and the reliability of those ratings by conducting extensive trainings for cooperating teachers and program supervisors on using those observations. We also highlight a number of state examples of observation instruments for pre-service teachers, since there's a lot of strong examples out there. In addition to these topics, we address Others like stipends for cooperating teachers, aligning cl uh, clinical placement with future hiring needs, and technological solutions to streamline placements, and, and lots more. So there is a lot of really exciting work, and it's, it's interesting to see different examples of how different places are tackling some of these challenges. So I'll turn it back over to Christy. So if you're interested in checking out the resources we've already discussed, uh, we encourage you to check them out on our website. We have some tiny URL links on the screen, uh, which might make it a little bit faster for any future viewers to get there. 
Um, and we're also going to talk about something we accompanied with the framework during the release, which was a document that defined the different types of clinical practice, which we've listed here in the blue boxes. We worked with the field to establish clear definitions of the elements of each type of clinical experience because clarity matters. When I was talking a little bit about the case studies, I was talking about apprenticeships and residencies, um, and we just wanted to clarify a little bit what each of those mean and what they typically entail. So today we'll spend a little bit of time looking at the clinical practice models we saw. The traditional model is what most of you are probably the most familiar with, which is the most widespread form of clinical practice used by teacher preparation programs. Teacher candidates observe and gradually take on teaching responsibilities over a period of 10 to 16 weeks, often unpaid. This model provides structured guidance from cooperating teachers and is typically aligned with a university degree program. Although candidates gain valuable in-classroom experience, its effectiveness can vary depending on the quality of the cooperating teacher. Still, research shows that first-year teachers trained in this model can perform as effectively as a third-year teacher, especially when they're placed in a similar demographic setting to their student teaching placement or if they have a highly qualified cooperating teacher. Professional development schools take this a step further by emphasizing strong partnerships between universities and local schools. In this type of program, teacher candidates are embedded in schools for at least a semester and benefit from shared responsibilities between the school and university faculty. These programs foster a close link between the coursework and classroom practice, ensuring candidates are prepared for the realities of teaching. And this collaborative approach leads to higher feelings of preparedness among candidates and can have a positive impact on student learning outcomes. However, this approach is probably one of the more dwindling approaches to classroom management in the current, current landscape. Next, we have teacher residency programs. This model typically involves a full year commitment where candidates co-teach alongside experienced mentors while completing coursework. TRPs are especially effective in high needs districts with a focus on recruiting candidates who are likely to stay in the district after completion. One of the key benefits of this model is the high retention rate for graduates, many of whom feel more prepared for the classroom due to the immersive hands-on experience. And the newest version of clinical practice that we've seen are registered teacher apprenticeships, which have a earn while you learn model that allows teacher candidates to be paid while gaining practical experience. These programs are approved by the U.S. Department of Labor and focus on reducing financial barriers, which make it an attractive option for a diverse candidate pool. Apprentices gradually take on more teaching experience, but are never fully responsible for the classroom until they're fully licensed. The paid component ensures financial stabi stability, which can make a significant difference in attracting and retaining future teachers. But it's uh, not it's a little bit too soon to have really strong research uh evidence on the actual long-term outcomes at this time. The next two that we see um, have less strong research-based outcomes um, and less rigorous clinical practice experiences, but are things that we frequently see within the field. So the first type that we see are abbreviated clinical practice with first-year support, which offers a shorter, more condensed period of student teaching, typically around four to seven weeks, after which candidates take on the role of a teacher of record. To compensate for the brief clinical practice, they receive mentorship and support throughout their first year. This model has proven effective in diversifying the teaching workforce because it provides a quick route to the classroom. However, its long-term effectiveness in teacher retention and student outcomes is mixed. Uh, on the other hand, we also see a fast track without experiencing teaching full-time. This pushes candidates into teaching roles after minimal preparation, often after just a few weeks of training or a few weeks of observing without actually being in the classroom teaching. This model is appealing because it quickly fills teacher shortages, especially in high demand areas. However, this speed comes at a cost. Research has shown that these teachers often struggle more in their early years and try and tend to leave the profession at higher rates. Students in these classrooms also tend to have lower outcomes compared to students taught by teachers from more robust preparation models. Um, and from there, we are going to open up to Q&A. Uh, and this is all that we have for today. So thank you so much for listening and we're happy to take any questions.
And I see one question from Stephanie Stoller in the chat. Um, are there examples of residency and apprenticeship models that are delivered in partnership with traditional brick and mortar colleges and universities? Um, the answer is yes, absolutely. So um, residencies sometimes are offered by standalone programs um, like Relay can be a standalone program, but also there are many that partner with traditional universities. So one of the um, examples that we highlight in the case studies is Beaumont Independent School District in um, Texas. They wanted to start a residency program. They partnered with their local university, Lamar University, which offered traditional teacher prep and worked with them to build a residency program. They brought in US prep for support. Um, and they were able to not only craft this residency program, but also work with Lamar to identify candidates from the traditional program who they thought were doing especially well and could take on some greater responsibility through the residency program. Um, and so they've they've kind of built out that program. They're going to their second year. Um, we also feature in the case studies uh, Chicago Public Schools, which has developed its residency program, and they partner with a mix of different institutions, including Relay and some local traditional programs. Um, as for apprenticeships, the apprenticeship program has to have some kind of sponsoring institution, and so those can vary widely in whether that's a, a local or a state education agency, a teacher prep program. So the one apprenticeship model that we feature in the action guide is University of Nevada, Las Vegas, which started out as a traditional teacher prep program. They still have that traditional model going, um, but they have separately created this apprenticeship. And... Um, so there, you know, people are taking courses at the institution, um, including their general education coursework, because many, many of the people who are going to the program had not previously earned a bachelor's degree. Um, but I think with some of what that makes that program really notable is how much they engaged the people they wanted to recruit into the program, predominantly paraprofessionals in figuring out what their needs were and how to design the program to really be attentive to their needs. So one of the features they added was some additional support and kind of a, a training course at the outset of how do you navigate college? So helping them understand like scheduling, how to reach out to an advisor, how to kind of keep track of everything. Um, they also layered some additional mentoring and support, but it was very much designed to help people go through the traditional institution through this apprenticeship program. Yes, I see um, uh, Suad has a raised hand. Feel free to just- Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation and the information you provided. Just a side note that uh, whether the teacher can, and I know you have presented research that shows it's been contributing to the effectiveness of the teacher when they are getting paid during their student teaching. Uh, a side note to that is that this is dependent on the state and their approach. For example, here in Indiana, we've been, working with the state very closely and trying to get student teachers paid. But unfortunately, the original rationale to that, uh, they say this is their full-time position where they learn teaching rather than they have all the responsibilities on their shoulders. So the rationale stresses the need for them to be able to focus without the burdens of full-time teaching, so to speak. Uh, but we have a similar program, uh, similar to the apprenticeship programs that you're doing in Nevada. Uh, we call it the transition to teaching programs where they have already their bachelor's degrees and they come back and they could full-time student teach. So my question to you at this point, with such variety, mm -hmm on how much stress we're putting to clinical experiences and how effective it is based on the research, supporting research. How would you be able to um, equitably assess the effectiveness of EPPs or teacher education programs while there is such variety? Thank you. That Oh, no, that's a great question. So, and and I think, first of all, to your piece about paying student teachers and how it really, it's largely a state matter. I, I think that's true. We're seeing a lot of states starting to pass policies 
um, to offer stipends to student teachers because they're realizing that if they, especially if they're worried about teacher shortages, this is a place where they're losing potential teachers. These are people who want to go into the classroom, but it's it's hard and sometimes not even allowed to have a job on the side while you're doing full-time student teaching. Um, so we are seeing more states moving in that direction. Um, we're seeing some states building into that policy and evaluation component. So hopefully there'll be more data in the coming years about the effectiveness of um, of paying student teachers a stipend. We're also seeing states um, work with districts to find ways for districts to come up with the money. So Texas is a great example. They have really set into statute um, what they think the criteria for a high quality clinical experience is as part of high quality preparation in general. And then they were able to use ESSER funds to kind of get districts off the ground paying stipends. And then they've provided a lot of technical assistance to districts to help them figure out how they can rework their school staffing models to make sure that that funding is sustainable once the ESSER funds go away. So having student teachers serve a couple of days a week as a paraprofessional or a substitute or a tutor, like things that would be paid positions anyway, having student teachers uh, fulfill those roles and get paid for it. Um, to your broader question, though, about how we can um, equitably and fairly assess uh, teacher prep programs given the variety, um, I, that is such an important and a challenging question. But the the way that we think about it is no matter what the program is, it's preparing teachers for fundamentally the same job. I mean, we know that there is wide variation between schools, between grades, but um, one of the things that we've seen, for example, in teacher preparation, when we're looking at um, mathematics preparation for elementary teachers, is there is tremendous variation between undergraduate programs and graduate programs. Undergraduate programs tend to require far more coursework for aspiring elementary teachers than graduate programs do. But they're preparing people for that for the same job. And so whether you're coming in through an undergraduate program or a graduate program, you need to be able to teach math. And so with that standard, we worked with researchers to to and with uh, you know, using the research that's out there to identify kind of what are the fundamental uh, areas of math that elementary teachers need to know, how many hours of coursework do they need to understand it, how do we build a standard around that? We follow a similar uh approach with all of our standards. So with clinical practice, with uh, with reading, with classroom management, we work with experts in the field. We dig into the research to figure out what is it that teachers need to minimally have to be effective with their, with their students from day one, especially since we know that students of color, students living in poverty are most likely to get new teachers. It is really important that every new teacher goes into the classroom with at least the basics. So whether they're coming in through an alternative route from through a graduate program, undergraduate program, residency, apprenticeship, all those teachers need the same fundamental preparation. And so we work with, with our experts, with the field, with the research to really identify what are those core elements and we build a standard around that. Um, so every time we come out with a new standard, we make sure that we um, go through a rigorous development process, that we pilot test it with a range of different programs. And we also are working to increase our transparency about like what we are looking for with our programs and what we're rating them on. Um, and Christy actually leads a lot of that work. So Christy, if you'd like to add anything, please do. No, I think you, I think you covered it. Uh, we have a good question in the chat for, by Lauren Brannon. So she says, in-service teachers already have so much on their plate. How can we encourage them to take on additional training and responsibilities to serve as mentor teachers? Do you have any examples of how stipends can be funded and do some institutions or states provide additional credentials? That is a great question. So we are continuing to look at state policies around um, credentials and requirements for mentor teachers. So um, that I don't have a great answer for. In general, it seems like states don't really set a lot of criteria for, for mentor teachers. The most common criteria that we've seen in the past is just they have at least three years of teaching experience, um, which, you know, is is not necessarily enough to make sure that you know how to effectively mentor adults, which is why we're kind of saying it's also up to the districts and the prep programs to provide that additional support. Um, 
As for the question about encouraging them to take on additional responsibility, it is more work. Um, we have done a scan of state policies and district policies to figure out how often are they giving mentor teachers some kind of incentive, whether it's financial incentives or release time, or um, sometimes they move them higher up the salary schedule. Um, they might get a, a title change. Um, I was disappointed that at least in the districts, we looked at the largest district in every state and we'll be publishing those. Actually, we just, we just published those results a couple of weeks ago. Um, Christy, if you're able to pull up the most recent trend line, we, we have that data there. Um, but we did not see as, as many districts setting into place those policies as we would like. And obviously districts have financial limitations. So again, this is where we're thinking about strategic staffing and how you can have student teachers fulfill multiple roles, which can free up money for them, but also potentially for their mentor teacher can be valuable. Um, it's also would be great for states to kick in some money. We're not seeing that happen a lot. We'll be publishing those results next year. Um, but I think it's also important for prep programs to recognize that this is a need and to figure out if there's ways that prep programs can also offer some kind of incentive. I mean, prep programs are you know, not always, <laughs> don't always have financial flexibility, but if you can offer free coursework, if you can offer um, other incentives, or if you can work with districts to kind of encourage them, like, we'll make sure you get a lot of student teachers in the subjects that you need, if you can do X to support us in finding mentor teachers. Like, there, there may be some ways to collaborate on that, um, but I, I wish we had more strong examples than we do, um, but, but there are some places that are doing good work in that area. We have an additional note from Scott Bogan in the chat. Uh, we're fine with stipends in Indiana. Our concern are about paying them as substitute teachers. We want to be sure they are supported during their 10 weeks of student teaching without being put in other classrooms as substitutes. Yeah, so the I think the way to kind of walk that line is to really limit how much time somebody can spend as a student teacher or as a substitute while the student teaching. So most places that take that approach will say it can only be like one day a week or at most two days a week. So the bulk of their time is really spent with their mentor teacher in their classroom. Um, ideally, also, they have a longer residency program, longer Longer um, clinical practice is not necessarily associated with better uh, teacher effectiveness. It is associated with better teacher retention. Um, but if you're pulling out student teachers one or two days a week for other needs, it's worth thinking about how we can add on a little extra time there. Um, there are other places that are kind of, that's actually another reason that some states have started implementing stipends. So um, Michigan, I believe, it's one of the states we feature they found that a lot of their student teachers were leaving student teaching and getting jobs as full-time substitutes instead because they could make more money as a full-time substitute than as an unpaid student teacher. And so they would just get a job sooner, never actually finish their preparation, which is obviously not ideal for anybody. Um, so that was one of the reasons that the state made the case that they need to start offering stipends to student teachers to make it financially more attractive to go through student teaching and to, to finish that, that, um, that training. And so they have since implemented stipends and are starting to see positive results. Um, similarly, um, Texas has not su successfully um, gotten the legislation passed, but they've been working on legislation that would um, put people who go through more robust uh, clinical practice, like residency models, they would be on a different and higher salary schedule than people who went through some of these fast track programs where they get little to no preparation. Um, so that's you know not not quite addressing the substitute issue, but more like thinking strategically about how to use pay as an incentive, not just to get people into the classroom, but to get them to go through the preparation routes that you want them to go through. And um, we have a question from Kristen Jaworski. Are there any studies on whether giving mentor teachers a stipend makes a difference in the quality of mentoring they provide? Or is this mentioned more as a solution for recruiting a sufficient number of mentors in the classroom? There is a surprisingly small amount of research about stipends for cooperating teachers and mentor teachers, period. Um, it is something that we looked into in our research rationale. The whole research rationale is like 35 pages long. The section on mentor teacher stipends is like a couple paragraphs. Um, if I recall correctly, the top lines from the research that's been done is basically 
stipends for cooperating teachers and mentor teachers is really small and it's either not changed or actually decreased slightly in like 50 years. So 50 years ago, state uh, mentor teachers were only getting paid a few hundred dollars a semester. That's pretty similar to what it is in a lot of places now. We are seeing some movement. Um, yes, I see Stephanie saying it'd be a great dissertation topic. Yes, I, I plus one that. Um, the other bit of research, um, Dan Goldhaber and some of his colleagues at Calder did some research looking at Washington State to figure out what is the value add of a strong mentor, a strong cooperating teacher. And he, he's the one who led the study that also found that having a strong cooperating teacher can make you um, basically as effective as a second or third year teacher. Um, so he was looking at how much more effective is somebody when they are uh, paired with a strong cooperating teacher. And then when we think about kind of the learning curve for first year teachers, what is that additional effectiveness worth in terms of salary dollars? And he basically tried to quantify how much is a cooperating teacher worth in terms of the, the value they add to their teachers, student teachers' future effectiveness. Um, and then said, like, we are not paying cooperating teachers nearly enough just to make it, like, just to recognize the value that they are adding. Um, but there, I, I could find very little research about the role of stipends and recruiting cooperating teachers. And, and I don't think there is anything about making them more effective. I think that's a really interesting question. Uh, um, Lauren Brannon <clears throat> asks, can you speak to effective models on supporting teacher candidates who are currently teaching on an emergency certification? In Alabama, most of our candidates earning an alternative master's degree in education are already teaching in their own classrooms. Yeah, this is, this is a big question that has, you know, it, it's, been a topic for a while, but especially in the aftermath of the pandemic. Um, there were some early studies that were finding that, oh, maybe it's not so bad that people didn't finish tra traditional teacher or any teacher prep that they are going to the classroom with emergency licenses. Um, there is a study that came out in Massachusetts about a year ago that kind of suggested, oh, teachers who are coming out on emergency certifications are about on par with traditional teachers. It turned out that's because the, the people in that first year or so of the cohort were already people who had gone through some traditional teacher prep. They may have already been serving in the classroom as paraprofessionals. They were in the teacher pipeline. They just hadn't finished it yet. Um, once that policy was in place for a few more years, they found that the effectiveness of people coming in through emergency licenses rather than through through earning a full traditional license, they were far less effective in several subjects. Um, and then the retention rates were also not looking great either. Um, similarly, Texas, Texas Tech has done some studies to um, to look at what's happening with teachers who are coming through in through these online programs, which are often the fast track, little to no preparation, um, and their effectiveness is dismal and their retention rates are quite low. So it's, it's basically just creating a revolving door of ineffective teachers. So people are spending money to get these um, to get these fast track programs, going to the classroom, leaving quickly, everybody loses. Um, so in terms of how to support them, um, I, I think, again, figuring out how to pair them with mentor teachers is really important. Texas passed some legislation, which is linked in, in their case study in our action guide, um, where they are now requiring for people who came in through emergency licenses or fast track programs um, to get additional observations early on in their in their teaching experience and to get some additional support and coursework. So they're trying to kind of make up for the fact that in Texas, it's like a, a massive proportion of people coming in without um, going through preparation. Um, so I, I think finding ways to pair them with mentor teachers. There is research even for for novice teachers who have a mentor, especially if they have a mentor for a couple of years, that does tend to help them be more effective and to stay in the classroom longer. So um, I, I think finding ways to give them that additional like expert teacher support is really important. Um, and also like the research on observations and feedback from a more kind of evaluation standpoint is a little bit more mixed, but I think it is important for teachers to be observed regularly, to be given feedback even if it's not from the person who's doing their evaluation. Um, Tara Haskins asks, do you find that mentor endorsements or certificates makes a difference in quality of mentor? And I guess I wanna add, what does make a difference in quality of mentor if we do know? Yeah, so again, this is an area where I don't know that there's enough, um, there, there aren't that many places that we've seen that are doing clear like endorsements or certificates for mentors. It seems like a, it's something that 
people are, that prep programs that districts are starting to think more about. Um, but I had asked several experts who are kind of the leading researchers in this field, what research have you seen about what makes for effective training for cooperating teachers? And they basically said, we don't really know, nobody really knows, which is a terrible answer. <laughs> um, so again, like this is an area where we need a lot more research about how to help mentors become more effective. Um, so in terms of endorsements or certificates, I have not seen any research. Um, we do know that being some that being instructionally effective makes somebody more effective, um, so makes their student teachers go on to be more effective. So looking at um, value added scores, also effectiveness as measured by observation seems to matter. Um, we we think that being effective at mentoring adults matters, but it's that's more based on kind of intuition, expert input, less so based on research. There's not really a lot of research um, that's really quantified that and then connected it to student teacher outcomes. Um, we are hearing anecdotally from places that are doing a lot of work around um, uh, helping helping uh, cooperating teachers provide feedback. So how do they have difficult conversations? How do they make sure they're using the observation instruments fairly and not giving everybody a really inflated grade? Um, so some like very discreet skills like that. And again, we, we feature some of those stories in the action guide. Um, but this is an area where it's not a total black box, but it's it's a lot more gray than we would like. And we we would really love to see more research in this area. Uh, I wonder, what are some opportunities to use AI or other technology to supplement in-person clinical experiences? Yeah, so there are some really interesting um, technological advances that some places are using to support clinical practice. So um, I think in one of the examples that Christy mentioned from, um, from Western Governors, they are an online prep program that serves candidates in all 50 states. They have something like 4,000 candidates going through a year. Um, and they want to make sure that people are getting really robust preclinical experiences, but it's hard to facil facilitate that in classrooms all the time. So they are taking advantage of online simulations like Mersion, um, which can have people kind of teach to a, um, in, in this case, it's not AI, it's a, a class that's run by a it's a class of avatars where somebody is a trained actor who's kind of voicing the roles of the different students, but that gives them an opportunity to practice teaching in an online setting. Um, there's some early research, um, Christy, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Julie Cohen from, I want to say UVA, is doing some work looking at other online coaching and kind of testing the waters of giving um of using an AI tool to give feedback to teachers. So whether they can, um, uh, so it's having teachers often record themselves in a classroom, sometimes just an audio recording. Um, an AI tool will will build a transcript of their lesson and then actually identify kind of discrete skills. So we've seen research on, for example, um, I think like probing students thinking, asking deeper questions, things like that, so that you can train an AI model on a very specific skill and then use it to give teachers feedback on their lesson. So that's another really interesting example where technology can support giving feedback to, to student teachers. So I, I think there's, you know, it's, it's a pretty nascent area for the field, but one with a lot of opportunity. Yeah, this is actually something I've read about for our classroom management uh, work that we're currently doing. It is Julie Cohen, you're completely correct, from UVA, who's been doing this work. Uh, and if you know anything about how nurses uh, are trained, they have a lot of these simulation experiences prior to actually meeting patients, and it functions very similarly. So you get to have practice in some of these difficult conversations, conversations with parents, um, and it can be kind of funny if you ever watch these actors and see how they perform. They put these the student teachers through difficult, you know, scenarios, very stressful scenarios. So when you actually encounter that for the first time with a real student, a real parent, a real family, you're a lot more skilled through that interaction. You're able to do that a lot more skillfully and without never having encountered it before. Um, so highly recommend you look into that work. Um, and uh, we have one more thing from the chat. So we have from Lena M. Some states, New Jersey, have a teacher leadership endorsement. This program is great to enhance leadership skills for teachers who are not going into the administrator role. This could should help with some skills, but I know we are always looking for more to help grow our mentoring skills. And then we have Kristen Jaworski says, I'm skipping the links you shared. Can you point me to where 
to find the information you shared on the different types of models, including the abbreviated clinical practice model. And yes, Hannah is sharing the different types of clinical practice document. Uh, and we all also do provide some example programs uh, and different types of preparation models that we've seen that match that. And Hannah, I think you touched on this slightly, but we often hear that you know the length of the experience is one of the most important parts of the experience. How important is it to offer a longer clinical experience? Yeah, that's a great question because we have seen, especially pre-pandemic, there was a big push towards year-long residencies, and it seemed like that was the the um, direction that everybody thought prep programs should be going. Um, the research basically does not find that longer clinical experiences make teachers any more effective. It does seem to suggest that it, it improves their retention rates once they go on to be teachers, which definitely is important, especially when we're concerned about high levels of teacher turnover. Um, it may make teachers feel more prepared for the classroom. Um, I think the other opportunity there with year-long residencies is um, we talked a bit about the importance of different types of settings of making sure that somebody's uh, student teaching experience is aligned with their future classroom. I think having a longer period of time for clinical practice does open up some oppor opportunities for somebody to work in a few different settings. And so they can be exposed to more different uh, teaching approaches, more different curriculum materials, more different school settings. And so they might be more prepared for those different scenarios once they go on to become a teacher. Um, and we are seeing some places, especially some state policies, um, thinking very uh, explicitly about how to require a, a range of different ex experiences where they have somebody maybe do a small amount of time in, in a few different settings before they go on to their full-time student experience. So I think there's some ways to think about what the purpose of the longer clinical practice experience is and how to make sure that you're really maximizing the benefits of that. Uh, unless we have any additional questions, I think we can start to wrap up for the evening. Uh, if you want to connect, uh, you can reach out to Hannah Putman at hputman at nct nctq.org. If you would like to talk about reading or classroom management or anything else, you can also reach out to me, C. Ellis at nctq.org, uh, and I'm happy to chat as well. Thank you all so much for joining us today and for all these really great questions. If, and as Christy said, if you want to talk more, if you have examples that of your work that you think we should feature, the nice thing about our action guide is we can always add more to it. So we'd love to hear stories that you have to share as well. Yes, thank you so much, Christy and Hannah. And then uh, I will email the link to the recording by the end of the week to all registered participants. So it was so great to see you and hopefully we'll see all of you next month for um, our uh uh, October webinar, I couldn't remember the month, sorry, our October webinar on IDA accreditation with uh, Bethany Moffitt. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having us, Megan. Yeah. Yes, this was great. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording.